This is Nightly Business Report with Sue Herrera and Bill Griffin. Job engine, the unemployment rate hits a 50-year low and stocks end this volatile week on a high note. Renewed optimism. A new report says Apple is ramping up production of its newest iPhone, a potential sign that demand for its flagship product is rebounding. Logged off. Why the hardwood lumber industry is falling on hard times. Those stories and much more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Friday, October 4th. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. The labor market remains tight, though it is showing some signs of slowing. The unemployment rate sits at a half-century low, despite a string of weak economic reports that raised questions about the health of the economy. That offered some relief for investors, and stocks took off. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 372 points to 26,573. The Nasdaq added 110, and the S&P 500 was up 41. But the solid hiring in September came at a slower pace, and it was a little less than what economists had expected. Steve Leisman takes a closer look at America's employment picture. The U.S. job market continued slowing in September, with the fewest jobs created in four months as concerns gather that a slowing economy is taking a toll on employment and possibly even the consumer. Payrolls grew by just 136,000 in September, below Wall Street's consensus of 145,000 and well under the monthly pace of last year. That was north of 200,000. But economists point to two reasons for the slowdown. The first is slowing economic growth along with the trade war. We have seen a significant slowdown over the last year, and I think the, the weakness is more related to trade and also some of the softness we saw in um, uh, spending on services over the summer. One piece of evidence for the trade war having an effect, a loss of 2,000 workers in manufacturing with monthly job growth this year, just a quarter of what it was in that sector in 2018. Elsewhere, the government added 22,000 workers, highlighting that private sector job growth was really quite weak. Leisure and hospitality added 21,000, but retailers shed 11,000 workers. Economists point to a second reason why job growth is slow. With the unemployment rate falling in September to 3.5%, a 50-year low, it's just become tough to find workers. Well, I, th I think the most important thing to recognize here is the limits to growth. I mean, it's great to see an unemployment rate of 3.5%, the lowest since 1969. Uh, but everywhere in this report, you can see that businesses are really finding it hard to find qualified workers. But I think these job numbers will slow as we head towards the end of the year. We've got a supply side constraint and we've got a demand side constraint uh, because of the trade war and the impact that's having on business psychology. Many economists share the outlook that job growth will slow further in coming months. That would be bad news for the economy. A strong consumer buoyed by a plentiful job market has held up U.S. growth so far this year. The good news? The current level of job gains, if they stick around, should be enough to hold on to decent U.S. economic growth. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Steve Leisman. Let's turn to Sam Coffin now for more analysis of the jobs report. He's senior economist at UBS. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Hi, thanks for having me. Let me ask you this. Uh, this slowdown in job growth, how much do you attribute it to the trade war? How much of it is just simply the business cycle? We think it's really uh, an effect of the trade war. We saw real slowing in manufacturing late last year as tariffs interrupted the supply chain that manufacturers rely on. We think that's happening again now. Uh, and and while we, what we've been expecting is to see the effects of the current round of tariffs uh, would be to slow growth to near recession early next year. It looks like that's happening a little sooner than we expected and maybe a little uh, more severely. So where does that put the Fed? Are you in the camp that we see just one more rate cut, or given what you just laid out, would it be more than that? We think they're on the way to cutting to a 1% funds rate. Uh, today, after the, after the payroll report and after the week uh, business surveys from earlier in the week, we cut our Fed funds rate forecast for October. We think they'll cut in October and continue cutting uh, through the through first half of next year. So if the problem is mainly the trade war, the negotiations with China begin again next week. What if we get a trade deal at some point here in the near future? Yeah, it could help a little bit, but a lot of the softening is already in train. The manufacturing sector has been under strain for a long time. They've been laying people off. The energy sector is laying people off and rig counts are falling. Uh, retail has been weak for a long time. And just the, 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 the hit to confidence from, from the trade war and the uncertainty around it and, and the actual physical effects of, of restricted imports 
uh, have, have had a real effect on, on those sectors. So we're at the point of no return, in your view? Uh, not no return, but, but, but it's un, uh, we're unlikely to see a real acceleration from here until after some of the current strains are, are, are worked out. And they don't just go away uh, with, with, with uh, some relentment on the December tariffs, for example. Which has led you to cut your forecast for GDP growth. Yeah, a little bit. So, so we've, been, we've been expecting almost a recession early next year, 0.4% uh, growth in the first half of next year. Uh, today, we trimmed our fourth quarter numbers a little bit. Uh, the auto sector, obviously, the, the strikes are going to have an effect there. And because the deceleration in payrolls has been sharper than we expected. Sam Coffin with UBS. Again, thanks for joining us tonight, Sam. Thank you. And later in our program tonight, our market monitor thinks that the consumer will remain strong. She has three stocks that she's betting will benefit as a result. Today, the chair of the Federal Reserve said the economy is, quote, in a good place and that it's the central bank's job to keep it there. Jerome Powell also highlighted some challenges facing the economy, including low growth, low inflation and low interest rates. In his speech today, he did not hint at the likely direction of interest rates. As Steve Leisman reported a few moments ago, the manufacturing sector lost some jobs last month. It's feeling the effects of the trade wars. But that is not the only challenge it's facing. There is still this chronic shortage of workers. Kate Rogers went to Newberry, South Carolina, to find out what's being done there to address the problem. The manufacturing sector is looking for more skilled workers like Rodney Ridley. Ridley, an Army vet, is a production supervisor at Samsung's washing machine facility in Newberry, South Carolina, managing a team of nearly 70 workers. I enjoy very much what I do. Uh, I like teaching. I like leading. Uh, I like showing individuals what's important to them and what pays their bills. Samsung's facility has been open for two years, employing 800 workers. It'll need an additional 200 to keep up with demand. Attracting and retaining workers is a challenge for the entire industry as baby boomers age out and younger workers stay on the sidelines. More than half a million jobs are currently open, and in the next decade, an estimated 4.5 million manufacturing positions will need to be filled. But experts say more than half may remain unfilled due to the skills gap. If we're not successful in closing the skills gap, it's bad news for America. It means we're not going to be as competitive as we need to be in the global economy. It means America's economic might is not going to be as good as it should be. And it means lost opportunities or lower standards of living for Americans in all areas of the country. In order to get the next generation of potential workers interested in manufacturing, Samsung participated in something called Manufacturing Day, along with other companies across the country who opened up their doors to middle and high school students to let them in and see what it's like to actually do this job, a manufacturing job that's become increasingly cleaner and more high tech. It's cool. I mean, manufacturing is really cool. I think these old Stereotypes of manufacturing is sort of a dirty job. That's really gone. Now advanced manufacturing is a really complex process. It's one there are lots of opportunities to learn skills. And students like Trustin Stack agree. You can learn a lot from this job too on how to build robots. Hoping students like these will help bridge the widening skills gap. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Kate Rogers in Newberry, South Carolina. The trade war with China is also hitting the hardwood lumber industry particularly hard. U.S. exports have dropped dramatically, and now the industry is cutting American jobs. Diana Olek has more. Workers at this mill in Mount Vernon, Washington, don't have much time left on the job because all 70 jobs will be gone next month as Northwest Hardwoods is forced to shut down this plant and another in Virginia, which will cut up to 30 additional jobs. China was their number one export customer. China used to account for about half of all U.S. hardwood lumber exports, about $2 billion annually. But a 25 percent tariff sawed through that demand. In the 12 months since tariffs on U.S. hardwood were announced in July of last year, lumber exports to China were down by $615 million compared with the previous year. In June of this year alone, when the full tariff rate went into effect, trade volume to China was half what it was a year ago. Northwest Hardwood CEO Nathan Jepson says the impact was too fierce, too fast. Our business 
uh, much like the rest of the industry, is highly dependent and, and has, has forged a, a large relationship selling into the Chinese market. And since the middle of last year, if, if you just look at year on year, uh, sales are off uh, 43% in, in total exports uh, to China. Jepson is attending the National Hardwood Lumber Association Conference in New Orleans this week, where there is plenty of tariff talk. This is a pretty uh, uh, depressed group. This is a pretty challenged industry. Uh, you know, we've survived a lot of things and a lot of downturns and, and, and shown resilience. I'm confident that uh, we'll do so again, but right now this is as scary as it's ever been. Ironically, China actually helped save the American red oak business. As it fell out of fashion in floors like this among U.S. consumers, the industry marketed it hard to China, and now it's a favorite there. Unfortunately, the Chinese are now finding it elsewhere. Instead of buying from the U.S., which is the most sustainable uh, forestry uh, uh, institute in the world, uh, they're buying from places like Russia and Central Africa and Southeast Asia, uh, many of which are, are known bad actors in terms of illegal harvesting, uh, deforestation, uh, and the like. Yet another victim in a trade war that continues to drag on, taking U.S. jobs along with it. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Washington. The latest threat of U.S. tariffs against the European Union now risks hitting billions of dollars worth of Italian food products including a staple of many American kitchens, Italian cheese. Villa Marx is in Nocetto, Italy for us tonight. Saverio del Sante is the sixth generation to raise cows here. That's one of his cousins clearing up the courtyard. We started with uh, five cows uh, and then uh, year per year we arrived at this uh, size. And I hope uh, next year to, I hope that my, my farm will improve uh, with a new barn uh, and a new robotic system to make the cow. Today, his family farm owns 150 cows and they in turn produce more than 1,100 gallons of milk each day. This region of north central Italy is, of course, farm country. There are other industries here, but a huge amount of the local economy, a lot of the work here relies on dairy and more specifically dairy for Parmigiano Reggiano, the cheese Italians call the king. Del Santo says business is good, that his milk fetches a high price since it supplies such a premium product. We are small dairy. We aren't uh, industries. So every day, for example, in my dairy, we produce 14 weeks of Parmigiano Reggiano. We, we didn't produce uh, thousands and thousands of, uh, of, uh, of cheese. Some of the technology may be new, but at nearby dairies like this, they create cheese the same way they have for around 900 years, slowly and by hand. America is the world's third largest consumer of Parmigiano, but a recent World Trade Organization ruling against the European Union for state subsidies of the aircraft manufacturer Airbus may change that. The US government plans to introduce 25% tariffs on agricultural produce from across Europe and Italian cheeses are a top target. We are not surprised at all to read that Parmigiano is on uh, that list, but we are very surprised about the fact they have chosen some products and some other products are not there. Fabrizio Raimundi is a spokesperson for the consortium that oversees Parmigiano production. We will fight against this kind of uh, um, politician uh, problem because uh, we think we need the protection of the Italian government and the European Union. Producers hope they'll get help from Brussels, which may pay them to store these wheels for longer or help them sell to new markets elsewhere around the world. Meanwhile, Del Sante says he's optimistic the unique taste of this cheese will ultimately overcome any Trump-driven price shocks. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Villa Marx in Noceto, Italy. Between the trade war and some mixed economic reports, Goldman Sachs says the best way to navigate a possible economic slowdown is with some reasonably priced stocks. In a note to clients, the firm said that the stable growth stocks fare best in environments of slowing economic growth and rising uncertainty. Over the past two years, those companies with a history of growth stability have returned 22 percent versus 16 percent for the S&P 500. On the list, Pfizer, AutoZone, Amdocs, J&J &J, and Walmart. Still ahead, why Apple may be ramping up production of its latest iPhone.
Microsoft has told the DNC that hackers linked to the Iranian government have targeted a U.S. presidential campaign as well as government officials. The company did not identify the campaign but said the attacks occurred during a 30-day period in August and September. But a separate report from Reuters says a hacking operation linked to Iran unsuccessfully targeted President Trump's re-election campaign. Apple was one of the best performing stocks in the Dow today. Its shares rose more than two and a half percent. There was a report that demand for its new iPhone is better than many expected. Josh Lipton has more. Investors are feeling more upbeat about the iPhone franchise, with the Nikkei reporting that Apple told suppliers to increase production of the new iPhone 11 lineup by as much as 10 percent or 8 million units to meet better than expected demand. Just this week, Apple CEO Tim Cook told reporters that sales of the new iPhone 11 series are off to a very strong start. Cook said he couldn't be happier with the launch, though he didn't disclose specific sales figures. These new iPhones boast a faster processor, longer lasting batteries, improved camera systems, and price is a selling point too. The iPhone 11, the successor to the iPhone 10R, was priced $50 lower at $699. But some tech analysts are already looking through this iPhone cycle and to the expected 5G iPhone coming next year. So I think we're through the worst. But as you point out, we, we do think this cycle is still going to be flat and maybe slightly down in units. And you really have to wait till next year with 5G. And I don't think a 5G phone is going to be a terribly different experience. But from a marketing a aspect, Best Buy and Verizon and others are really going to be pushing it. So I think you will see a stronger cycle a year from now. One question for investors to consider is how the expected 5G iPhone impacts demand in the quarters ahead. Does increasing chatter and excitement about that device hamper appetite for the current iPhone 11 lineup? Investors might have a better idea when Apple next reports earnings results on October 30th. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Josh Lipton at San Francisco. PayPal bails on Libra, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The payments company will be withdrawing from Facebook's cryptocurrency payment network, saying it made the decision to forego further participation. But PayPal added it still remains supportive of Libra's mission. PayPal shares rose about 2 percent to 102.79. Facebook was up a fraction to 180.45. Smile Direct Club is denying allegations in a class action lawsuit brought last week by dental trade organizations, accusing the company of putting customers at risk and false advertising. Smile Direct says it has certification and its manufacturers are in compliance with FDA regulations. Shares rose about 7.5 percent to 1472. Amusement park company Cedar Fair has reportedly turned down a $4 billion buyout offer from Six Flags. Reuters says that Cedar Fair felt that proposal was inadequate. Six Flags is already the world's largest theme park operator, and with this offer for Cedar Fair, it was looking to expand its operations and maybe achieve ticket pricing power. Cedar Fair shares dropped nearly 4 percent today to 58.35. We had Six Flags rising more than 1 percent to 49.35. Anavaya Holdings and Ring Central are partnering to create a cloud-based communication service. Avaya has, of course, made communication hardware for several years. It filed for bankruptcy two years ago because of stiff competition from upstart cloud-based providers like Microsoft and Amazon. Ring Central now gives Avaya its first entree to the cloud. Both Avaya and Ring Central shares skyrocketed today more than 28 percent. It is time now for our weekly market monitor who is betting on the consumer. The last time she was with us, she recommended Visa and PayPal, each are up more than 20 percent, and MasterCard, which is 39 percent higher. She is Marianne Montaigne, Portfolio Manager at Gradient Investments. Nice to see you again. Welcome back. Nice to see you. Thank you. So you're betting on the consumer and you are expecting a good holiday season, but you say value is key, which maybe explains your first pick, which is Dollar General. Right. So Dollar General is just like it sounds, a dollar type store. And uh, this is one that currently has about 17,000 stores out there. But they're uh, always beating their quarterly uh, estimates on same-store sales growth. 
And we think that they can probably grow 11 percent in earnings over the next 12 months. But if we get some resolution on the U.S.-China trade tariffs, that would provide a tailwind to uh, margins and earnings growth. So we think that's a good pick right there. And here's another one uh, for price-conscious families with a little higher price point, five below. Right. Yeah. So that's really addressing the preteen market, the kids, with a $5 and below uh, ticket price on each item. And there, they only have about 900 stores at the end of this year. So they're growing their stores at about 20 percent per year. And then you add on about 3 percent same store sales growth. And we think that they can grow earnings going forward at least 20 percent. And pro probably you would get about a 20 percent return uh, over the next 12 months on that. TJ Maxx companies, um, it, it has a couple of different lines that it's dealing with or stores that it's dealing with. Why do you like that stock? Well, that's one where they benefit from uh, the lack of traffic at the uh, department stores. Mm -hmm. And they also have a big online presence, which they're expanding. Now, they did stumble last quarter with their home goods stores. And I just saw that that was an issue across the board. It wasn't just them. They're not losing share. But I think they're really gaining share from the uh, department stores. And there's always that treasure hunt sort of uh, uh, feeling as you go into the stores or now as you go online. Uh, so this is one that I do like going forward, just because there's new, interesting things, but at a value price. And I think that's what the customer is looking for this year. Quickly, Marianne, you like the consumer, but it's the price-conscious consumer. Are you just cautious otherwise in the rest of the retail world? Pretty much, pretty much. I mean, there's some standout, uh, you know, brands, but um, across the board in retail, I think you need to be focused on the value offerings. Marianne Montaigne with Gradient Investments. Marianne, thanks so much. Thank you. And coming up, a movie, a controversy, and a calculated risk for the studio behind it. A new front in the so-called streaming wars. Disney is reportedly banning advertising from Netflix across its entertainment TV networks. This comes ahead of the launch of Disney's streaming service called Disney+. Plus. It's been widely reported that Disney, Comcast and AT&T plan to spend hundreds of millions of dollars over the next few years to attract customers to their new streaming services and away from Netflix. The Joker opens in theaters nationwide this weekend. It tells the story of how one of Batman's most popular villains was created. The movie has earned praise, but it has also courted a great deal of controversy, making it a risky release for the studio that produced it. Julia Borston explains. When you bring me out, can you introduce me as Joker? Warner Brothers' Joker, starring Joaquin Phoenix, landed in over 4,000 theaters around the country. The film is a dark and violent tale of a killer, sparking concerns that the film could incite violence at theaters. In the Aurora, Colorado theater, where there was a mass shooting during a Batman movie seven years ago, is not showing the film. Though the studio says there are no credible threats, the NYPD is stationing cops at theaters around the city. But that hasn't hurt demand. The film has grossed over $13 million in domestic previews last night. Overseas, Joker already brought in nearly $25 million. It's the number one foreign film in every market where it's been released. I think the controversy is only helping this movie. I think Joker is the kind of film that has a mystique around it, a mystery, and it's a very dark movie. Everybody knows that. And so this controversy is only fueling interest in the film. Warner Brothers predicts Joker will bring in at least $80 million at the domestic box office opening weekend, expected to top the October record set last year by Sony's Venom, with Fandango and Adam Tickets both reporting record October presales. While Joker is a standalone origin story, the question for Warner Brothers and its parent AT&T is what the film will do to bolster interest in its DC superhero universe ahead of Birds of Prey and Wonder Woman 1984 opening next year. 
And Warner Media will feature its studio's films in its upcoming streaming service called HBO Max, launching next year. I think what this movie does is it really differentiates DC Comics as being, it's always been more on the dark side thematically and from point of view than let's say Marvel. But this movie goes even beyond that, but I think it's a, it builds a level of prestige. Warner Brothers superheroes haven't performed as well at the box office as Disney's record-breaking Avengers from Marvel, which have taken a more lighthearted approach. I like this one. We'll see how this weekend's performance plays into the superheroes and the studio's rivalry. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Borston in Los Angeles. Before we go, here's a look at the day's final numbers from Wall Street. The Dow rose 372 points. The Nasdaq added 110. S&P 500 was up 41. And it was a mixed finish for the major averages to close out this volatile week, which is what we're going to do right now. Indeed. That's Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bill Griffith. Have a great weekend. See you Monday.